Are we good? I think we're good. Welcome to the um, March 5th meet, 2024 meeting of Soquel Creek Water District Board of Directors. Um, I'm calling the meeting to order. Roll call, please. Roll call, uh, Director Balboni. Present. Vice President Luther. Present. Director LeHugh. Yeah. Director Christensen. Yeah. And President Jaffe. Present. Okay. Um, so no public hearings, correct? Um, so this is opportunity for board members to remove items from the consent consent agenda. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to um, please remove 4.4. Um, okay, 4.4. The, MOA, yeah. the others. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. We might have somebody in the audience who wants to speak on this, on the, the items besides 4.4 and the consent agenda. All right, Becky. You are on. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrenner. I do have a comment on um, item 4.5 regarding the construction of the Kennison Lane Well project. I did um, receive a, a notice from your staff, Mr. Pollard, about this, and I sent him several questions uh, to which he did not respond, so I've sent it to your board. Um, I have a lot of concerns about the impacts on the neighborhood. I see that there will be um, a very high um, noise wall put up. How is that going to be supported? Is it going to be um, metal posts pounded in the ground like what happened at the Willowbrook uh, injection well that very much disturbed the, pro the residents in the area because it went all night. <laughs> and um, I guess the thing I uh, want to know is why isn't there any mention at all of potential MTBE impacts in this area? Um, your, your district is very well aware of that and did some studies and did, had to do work with the um, State Water Board to help monitor the problem, but it is within the area of this new Cunison well. And there's no mention at all of any monitoring or testing or anything for that. I respectfully ask that that be included in the uh, contract regarding the Cunison Lane well. And I also want to know where the source of the development, the well development water will be. Um, if it's going to be potable water, you have to extract the Thank chlorine. You. Thank you. All right. Um, any other public comments? Okay. Um, I'll move uh, approval of the approval. consent other than 4.4. Is there a second? I'll second. Would staff want to respond to the comment at this time or at a later time? Not now, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, so I, we can do a, a voice vote, right? So all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. <clears throat> so, um, oral and written communications. Met the opportunity for a member from the public to talk on something that's not on tonight's agenda. Becky. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's also the time when I can um, comment about correspondence that you have received. I think you can, yes. Thank you. I want to bring to your board's and staff's attention and the public. As long as it's not about an agenda item. Correct. The appropriate place would be when that agenda item is Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification. 
The letter that your board received from the Sierra Club is um, very concerning to me and should be to you regarding the Laurel Street Bridge Pure Water SoCal Conveyance Project Habitat Impact. I have spoken to you about this a number of times with my concerns. I have raised it in my litigation because uh, this, uh, this is a result of the district not collaborating with California Department of Fish and Wildlife for meaningful and enforceable mitigations. California Department of Fish and Wildlife was never consulted on the bridge, the Laurel Street Bridge pipeline conveyance attachments. And um, initially your project was going to dredge under the San Lorenzo River and then without any public notice it switched to being attached to the Laurel Street Bridge. I've talked with you about the impacts on the swallows. It was only because a citizen, Miss Jane Mio, brought it to someone's attention, not, not yours, because you haven't paid attention to this. But the biologists actually stopped your work because of the impacts on the this, this swallows on the bridge. Now I ask that you read this letter that you have received from Mr. Michael Guth from the Sierra Club. Observation indicates a steep drop in swallow nests beneath the Laurel Street Bridge since the Pure Water SoCal installation work began from an annual average of 50 nests to approximately 15, one five, after the implementation of the Pure Water SoCal project. And now the facade that is being put up to cover the pipe does not address this issue still. So I beg you, Please, follow the law, <laughs> work with Department of Fish and Wildlife, and continue this project with a meaningful mitigation for the impacts that, that it is causing. This is serious, and I don't ever get the feeling that you care. For example, Director Lee Hu is not even listening. He's looking down. <laughs> so. Please read this, and I urge the members of the public to read it as well. Um, finally, I will just draw your attention also to correspondence that I sent regarding uh, $14,000 a month credit card fees you, that your district you. is paying. Thank you. Thank you. I have read the letter from the Sierra Club, and I would bet a lot of money that Tom has as well. Yes, I have read the letter as well. And I have. Yeah. What are you going to do? How are you going Please to sit no, down? Just, just a second. Timer. I'm just letting you know. No, let's not go back and forth. Okay, but I want to right place. to respond. You, please I be can't. respectful and sit down, Ms. Steinbrenner. This is, them, Mr. Duncan. Please, thank you. Okay. All right, so, yeah, I'm not going to respond to you, Becky, if this is what it leads to, with back and forth. Um, but the, um, that brings us to any um, board members, any oral communication? None? Okay, so now we're on to reports. There are no reports. And then administrative business. So there are no conditional and unconditional will serves. And that brings us to 7.2, authorizing, authorize entering into a service contract for operation and maintenance, at-risk services for the Pure Water SoCal Advanced Water Purification Facility. Good evening, thank you, board. Um, I'm gonna be partnering with a couple people tonight on the presentation, and, and then, of course, we're also available for questions. But tonight, this item is item 7.2, the Pure Water SoCal Operations and Maintenance at Risk Service Contract. So we do have a short PowerPoint presentation, um, and I'd like to just outline that in terms of the, the slides, we're gonna do um, an introduction. We'll have a purpose and background. We'll go over the project, obviously the Pure Water SoCal project and give an update. And then we'll go into the key contract terms and the fiscal impact and then wrap up with the possible board actions. This is something I know that, that Ron is always um, very keen on, just in terms of uh, an executive summary. Um, 
we often don't know if we'll have a lot of people in the public um, that may be new to understanding pure water Soquel. So we do have a little bit of information just about our groundwater conditions and that the Santa Cruz County mid, -ground, mid County groundwater basin is critically overdrafted. We also um, are always available to share information related to the Pure Water Soquel project and specifically for the purification and treatment facility at the Shanna Clear site. And then, you know, tonight is about the operations and maintenance at risk contract that we are asking the board to consider for approval. So before I turn it over to my colleague, um, um, Cameron Costigan Mumford, who is our associate water resources manager at Soquel Creek Water District, who will be giving the PowerPoint presentation. I also did want to introduce a couple other people that are in the audience as well as online. We do have John Rickerman and also Paul Reel with Jacobs. Just raise your hand. We also have Anoop Shaw with Brown and Caldwell. And then, of course, we have Glenn Price with BBK, who is helping us with the contract terms and conditions and is doing the legal advisement as our counsel. Okay, and I'm going to turn it over to Cameron. Thanks, Melanie. And thank you, board. Um, Road less traveled to sustainability is what I think about when I look at this picture here of this bridge spanning across in this ravine. The district's come a long way, um, and the Pure Water Soquel project is nearing completion at this point. The next phase in this journey, it requires courage, determination, and also balance, in my opinion. But sustainability is within reach. Um, I commend everyone that's worked on this project, including the board members who have approved it um, and that embody this philosophy and making sound rational decisions. Um, with that being said, the purpose of this presentation tonight is really threefold. We want to present the service contract for the Operations and Maintenance at Risk, or OMAR, services uh, for the Pure Water Soquel Advanced Water Purification Facility, um, the AWPF. As I'll probably refer to it throughout this presentation. We also want to discuss some of the key terms of the service contract and the fiscal impact to the Soquel Creek Water District or the district um, and authorize the district to enter into a 10-year OMAR service contract uh, with Jacobs Engineering Group. Next slide. Thank you. So we face some major challenges with groundwater in our basin. As we know, it's critically overdrafted. Um, it's one of 21 basins within California that have such designation. And there's a mandate to become sustainable by 2040. In addition to being critically overdrafted, it's also considered a high priority basin because groundwater is the sole source of water. Um, we also know that there is strong evidence of seawater intrusion along the entire Monterey Bay coastline. So to help mitigate these issues and achieve sustainability, district developed the Pure Water Cell Kelp Project. Can you scroll down just a little? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, there's basically three elements to the project. You have your conveyance infrastructure project, um, which I don't know if you can see. There you go, thank you. It's the, the purple pipeline. It's not recycled water purple pipeline, but it is purple on this image here, um, which is essentially conveying your source water from the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Plant or the Santa Cruz facility all the way to the advanced water purification facility that's denoted there by the blue star. From there, you have three injection wells. Um, the pathway to get to those injection wells is the lighter blue pathway there, and the blue dots are the injection wells themselves. Um, that's where the purified water will be delivered into the basin. And I'll, in the next slides, I'll talk about the, the benefits and also the process itself. So we know that the benefits of this project are many fold. We show them here um, summarized. Um, since the source water for the Pure Water Soquel uh, Advanced Water Purification Facility is coming from the Santa Cruz facility, what that means is you have a reduction in the discharge of the Santa Cruz facility's effluent um, into the Monterey Bay by approximately 25%. We know that injecting this purified water into the basin is going to provide a seawater intrusion barrier as well as a reliable and drought-proof water supply, and the project can be accomplished pretty quickly 
uh, also using green energy. It promotes local economy, produces high quality water, and the facility has been designed um, to be scaled up, to be expanded in the future. Um, one thing that I'd like to add to that list of benefits there um, is, is also innovation. I think that is definitely a benefit of this project. When projects like this are completed, um, it sets an example of projects um, that are important and it shows others that they, they can be completed, um, they can be accomplished, and that they can be successful and effective uh, in, in their goals. So what you're seeing here is uh, what we call a process flow diagram. It's, it's really just the path of water that we're going to follow. Um, most of what we're focusing on tonight and with Jacob's contract will be what you see in the gray dashed area there. That's the advanced water purification facility. But it's important to note that the source water is coming from Santa Cruz um, uh, along the dark blue pathway, about five miles of pipe. Um, so initially it gets pumped through some strainers, makes that five mile journey over to the AWPF. There's an initial pretreatment set of ozonation to um, help remove some of the contaminants um, that are otherwise present in the source water that can impact other downstream unit processes like the ultraviolet and advanced oxidation process as well as the reverse osmosis system. So from there, it passes through microfiltration and then through reverse osmosis to remove things like bacteria and viruses. Um, and then it moves on to disinfection in the ultraviolet and advanced oxidation process. At that point, the water is very pure um, and we have some post-treatment, removing carbon dioxide to balance the pH, adding in some minerals, and then we're pumping it into the, um, the SWIP wells or the seawater intrusion prevention wells. Um, what I wanted to also note on that, that's okay. <laughs> what I also wanted to note on here is this is a very simplified process flow diagram. It doesn't encompass all of the system operation. And I think that's important to note um, because the district does not have operators uh, currently um, that hold or possess the required state licensure to be able to operate a facility like this, and they don't have the experience of operating a facility like this. But there are complexities within the system that um, Jacobs does have experience um, operating and managing and maintaining. Next slide. So all that process that you just saw, it's really contained in this kind of small footprint that you see here. On the left-hand side, there's a picture of what the lot used to look like prior to the development of the advanced water purification facility. Um, and it's a pretty small site, but like I said, there's room to expand. The back portion of the building can be entirely removed, um, and additional process uh, unit processes can be added onto there all without actually having to expand on um, some of the chemical tanks that we'll be using. Um, we'll just have other deliveries. Um, I think that was all I wanted to say about that, yeah. In terms of a program schedule, well, here we are, March 5th, and there we are, a red line. Um, and you can see um, the conveyance project is nearing completion. Um, and that will phase into the completion of the seawater intrusion prevention wells. Um, and then while that is occurring, we also have construction continuing at the AWPF uh, itself. Um, pretty soon, we expect to start some preliminary startup and commissioning of those facilities um, at the AWPF, at those, of those systems there. Um, and all that... Um, and the O&M the agreement that we've been working on with Jacobs and been developing um, is coming to, it, it's coming to fruition um, in, in, in April, basically. And then at that point, we'll be transitioning, a slow transition over to Jacobs so that we can eventually begin operation, so that Jacobs can begin operation of that facility um, in what we hope to be mid-November. And you can't see it because there's a, there's a screen up there, but that's, that mid-November date, oh thanks, is when we anticipate the first delivery of purified water to the Mid-County Groundwater Basin. I think just one thing to note on this, I know um, when we were talking about giving a program update schedule, 
this is just 2024, as you guys are well aware. There were many, many years prior to this. Um, that isn't on this diagram, but this is just a real narrow view of what's in store in this uh, coming months. In terms of contract operations, procurement for this really began back in 2019 with an RFQ that was issued. There was a selection committee that was put together um, with board members and district members alike, um, where CH2M Hill was selected um, in 2020, and CH2M Hill being a subsidiary of Jacobs. Um, Jacobs themselves, they have operation and maintenance services for more than 200 water and wastewater facilities in the U.S., and within California alone, they have more than 35 years of experience. Um, contract operations um, at uh, other facilities like in the city of, city of Gilroy, city of Auburn, Turlock Irrigation District, and uh, Twin Oaks Valley. Um, they've been involved with this process ever since the beginning in phase one where they provided professional advisory services during the design of the Pure Water SoCal project um, and into what we're in now, phase two, supporting the design builder um, during the construction, and then they will also be continuing that during the commissioning and acceptance of the project and the facilities themselves. But for today, well, I've highlighted phase three. That's the next phase. That's the one that needs the courage and determination and balance, right, to operate and maintain the AWPF over the long term. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Glenn, to talk about some of the key contract terms. Glenn, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Cameron. Um, I'm Glenn Price. I'm a partner with Best Best and Krieger, and I've been uh, working with staff um, to draft and negotiate the O&M agreement with Jacobs. It's a pleasure to uh, be here with you tonight and just go over some of the kind of summarize some of the key contract terms, um, given that the contract itself is very lengthy and technical, but we're just gonna give you some of the highlights here. So the term of the contract is for 10 years, and the term is broken into two periods, essentially, a baseline period and an OMAR period, which is the at-risk period for Jacobs. Uh, the baseline period is really for Jacobs and the district to work out all the kinks on operation of the AWPF, um, learn the most efficient way to run the, the facility in terms of the utilization of chemicals and electricity, and also making the best use of the water that's available from the Santa Cruz plant. Um, so during that baseline period, um, we'll be uh, kind of collecting data and determining kind of all of these various factors of how the plant's gonna be operated for the duration of its uh, life and service. Um, once that period's over, um, the OMAR period will kick in, and that is where Jacobs will take full responsibility for the operation of the plant based on the data and the kind of processes that have been determined during the baseline period. Um, there is an option uh, for the district to renew the agreement for an additional five-year term if it desires to do so at the end of the 10 years. In the event that the district um, decided at some point for, that it would like to take over operations of the plant for, for some reason, uh, we did provide that um, flexibility and it can do so on 180 days notice. There is an early termination fee and the purpose of that fee is to uh, compensate Jacobs for its investment kind of in the project, in the plant, uh, going up to the commencement date because Jacobs actually isn't being compensated by the district until the commencement date. So it's making that investment, uh, which it would expect to um, be reimbursed for over the 10 year period. So that's why the early termination fee actually starts at a higher number and then will go down over time as Jacobs is actually um, uh, getting reimbursed for that initial investment. Uh, next slide, please. So at all times during the, the term of the contract and, and following it, the assets, the AWPF, the Education and Operations Building uh, that's located on site, all of these assets are owned by the district. Um, Jacobs is responsible for managing those assets under the O&M agreement. And we'll get into some of the details of that on other slides. Um, as I mentioned during the OMAR um, baseline, uh, we will be uh, setting the operating standards for the plant. 
uh, for the various items I already mentioned, efficiency, use, and also making the most effective use of water. Um, this is particularly important so we can um, you know, determine what parts of the year are best for shutting the plant down for maintenance activities and also potentially um, having the plant um, reduce operations if there's not a lot of water available seasonally. And this will lead to a more efficient operation of the plant. Uh, next slide. So the primary purpose of the agreement is obviously operation and maintenance and Jacobs will be responsible for the operation and maintenance of the AWPF. Um, right now, as part of phase two, they are working with the design builder um, to create the operation and maintenance manual. And this is the primary docu document that'll be used to set the procedures and standards for the operation of the AWPF uh, once we commence operations in November. Uh, at that point, Jacobs will switch from a development um, position of putting that manual together along with a design builder to actually implementing uh, and running the plan pursuant to that manual. And, you know, an important component of the operation and maintenance is obviously preventive and corrective maintenance. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, under their maintenance, repair and replacement provisions, um, Jacobs will be responsible for all of the cost of doing routine maintenance um, up to a certain dollar amount. And that's part of its fees for the O&M. There's then also major uh, maintenance, repair and replacement. And this is all of the various parts of the plant that need to be replaced on a periodic basis, you know, including filters, UV bulbs, uh, various components that do need to be replaced um, from time to time. Uh, and uh, Jacobs with the input of the district is developing a, an MRNR schedule that'll set forth the time frame for that. And as part of that, there's an ongoing five-year forecast uh, for the district of what the expenditures will be on an annual basis, looking out uh, at least five years. Uh, next slide. So an Im obviously an important component of operations is staffing and training. And uh, Jacobs will be staffing the plant during regular business hours um, with six full-time employees. Uh, when the employees are not on site, there is kind of full ability to um, monitor the plant remotely. And uh, there will always be people on hand to, uh, to monitor the plant if there's any kinds of alar alarms or difficulties or issues with the plant. Uh, Jacob's staff will be available to handle those on an after hours or an emergency basis, as well as all of their activities when they're working full time at the plant. Um, we do have provisions in the agreement that if for any reason we had to um, substantially curtail the, the operation of the plant or even shut it down for a period of time, let's say because there was a, a problem at the Santa Cruz plant, that we are able to um, reduce staffing and work with Jacobs to do that to try to uh, save money during those periods when we might be non-operational for a long period of time. Um, Jacobs is responsible for um, obtaining all the necessary licenses and certifications for their staff, and they will be hiring uh, qualified and experienced individuals to work at the plant that have all those requirements. Uh, in addition to the individuals that uh, Jacobs will have at the plant, we also have the benefit pursuant to the agreement of working with Jacob's extensive uh, knowledge base of engineering and water quality professionals, water treatment professionals throughout the United States. So that's very helpful um, if anything happens that, you know, uh, staff or employees at the plant are not familiar with. Um, they have a very broad and diverse uh, knowledge base to draw from, from all of Jacob's other operations. Um, they will, uh, Jacobs will be having semi-annual workshops and training for um, district staff. And we thought that was a very important component uh, that's been uh, negotiated with Jacobs where they're gonna be helping our staff, our uh, water quality um, people and engineers to uh, learn how the plant works and have a good, a good feel for how it fits into the overall uh, operations of the district. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, with respect to the uh, coordination contract administration, Jacobs is available 24-7 for an emergency response if they need to be outside of the normal business hours, and they will be regularly working with um, staff at the district. 
Uh, next slide, please. Now, one thing that uh, an important decision that was made by the district was to handle its own procurement of electricity and chemicals. And this was done uh, so that the district could do that in the most cost effective manner and would not have to rely on Jacobs and uh, pay administrative and over costs, overhead costs for those uh, services. And that helps the district to save considerably over the life of the contract. So those will be separately handled by district staff um, during the baseline period. They will be, we, as I've mentioned, we will be um, kind of establishing what is the appropriate levels of chemical electrical use. Um, and one, once that is set, uh, part of the OMAR, the at-risk component of this for Jacobs, is that they will then operate the plant kind of within those um, thresholds that we've established for, for efficiency. And if um, for uh, if Jacobs goes over that electricity or chemical usage for reasons that are not excusable, let's say because of something that's the fault of the district or the or the result of water quality issues from Santa Cruz, if it's if it's instead the just an issue of the plants not being run as efficiently as it should, then Jacobs is on the hook for any excess mm -hmm. cost of usage of electricity and chemicals. On monitoring and reporting, this is obviously a very important um, part of the contract uh, because we have to stay in compliance with all of the district's permits and with the state. So Jacobs will be collecting and preparing all of the samples on a regular periodic basis as required by the district's permits. Um, the district has decided to um, actually control the laboratory testing itself, and that's to give it greater um, control and more accountability um, for um, not relying on Jacobs to provide it with the key testing, um, whether the plant is in compliance. So Jacobs will collect and prepare the samples and then they'll be shipped to an external lab that has been hired by the district and the district will then have control over uh, those results, which will go to the district and to various regulatory agencies. Um, in addition, the uh, Jacobs will be preparing, you know, various reports for the district from time to time on the operation of the plant and uh, providing data uh, so that the staff can monitor um, whether the plant is operating efficiently and per our expectations under the O&M agreement. Uh, next slide. So that's it. So um, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to uh, answer those from the board. Thank you. Any questions from the directors? I think um, maybe we can just have Cameron summarize this okay. slide and the next okay. slide. Yep. You want to hit on the fiscal impact and then the, the, mem the motion? Yes. If they, so you prefer to summarize and then ask the questions? Is that okay? Okay, sure. Thank you, Glenn. So for the in terms of the fiscal impact, um, for the baseline period, what we're projecting is $4.6 million for uh, at-risk uh, services provided by Jacobs. Um, that will apply to actually three fiscal years because we're project or anticipating the injection of purified water to begin uh, in November of this year. And since the baseline period is for 24 months, um, it will span those fiscal years. And so we'll be spreading those costs out. Um, those that um, they will also be um, an annual inflation adjustment um, that will occur. Um, and then other than that, um, we want to come back with a revised budget uh, for fiscal year 26 and 27 um, that we'll be um, updating the board on um, near the end of the baseline period after we have some operational experience and had an opportunity to op optimize the AWPF. Um, as Glenn had mentioned, um, this um, includes the removal of certain responsibilities from Jacobs for cost saving purposes, such as electricity, chemicals, um, analytical costs, uh, et cetera. Thank you. So, thanks. Um, so there's more? 
No, we can end here. This is just um, the summary recap where we just wanted to address that we did have the staff recommendation. Um, and then, of course, we have the possible board of actions for you to consider. And that's what's exactly the in the packet. Okay. So, clarifying questions before we open it up to public comment? I have a couple. Um, you too. You want to go ahead? No, go ahead. You can go. I'm still. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, one of the questions I had was when I was reading through it, it, it was saying it was $2 million a, a year and then it went to 4.6. So I have a question about that difference. Um, and then I'll just give them all to you. And then if, if um, will we have any input on their staff, like say there's something they're doing we don't like, um, or do we just address it with them and then they deal with their staff? That's another question. I need to know, I was curious what an NTE was. And then um, I think in the, there was a part on liquidated damages that I think you explained, Glenn explained that I think I understand now. But it said um, on the very last, on page um, 53 of the, Packet says Jacob shall pay liquidated damages in the amount of one thousand five hundred dollars, and then in parentheses it says four thousand dollars per million gallons of production shortfalls. And then it says such damages will not be payable to the extent that the shortfall results from a period of non-operation, where liquidated damages are imposed pursuant to incidents of non-compliance. So just you know, clarify that for me. It's just kind of a little bit of double negatives, and I get confused. Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to take that. Um, there's a couple different types of liquidated damages in the agreement, and the that difference between that fifteen hundred and the four thousand was uh, numbers we were negotiating with Jacobs. Jacobs has agreed to the four thousand per acre foot um, if a shortfall in water production is the fault of Jacobs when their plant is operating normally. So the kind of the qualifications or the double negative really has to do with two things. One is there's another form of liquidated damages where if Jacobs is not operating the plant um, within the quality requirements for the discharge of the purified water, and this is due to Jacob's fault and not an issue with, let's say, non-compliant water coming in from Santa Cruz, um, so that it would, you know, in which case it would not be their fault. But if they're not operating the plant uh, properly or having difficulty meeting the quality requirements, then the plant will be shut down because it can't operate if it's discharging water that doesn't meet quality requirements. And a different liquidated damage is in effect during a period when the plant is simply shut down for that. So this is separate from the water production uh, liquidated damages. And you know that's really meant for um, a case where the, the water is of the appropriate quality, but it's not the proper volume. So that liquidated damages would kick in when it's a volume issue. The other liquidated damages apply when there's a quality issue. And then my other questions were just what an NTE is. And then, um, cost we and the input on staff and the cost yeah i can um talk to the cost so the, the approximate two million dollars um so that was um i mean it's a little over initially every year there's going to be an adjustment uh, for inflation um that's going to be applied um to that number so then over the three fiscal years that we're looking at there's going to be three adjustment points basically um, to account for that. And so that's how you kind of get from what we're saying is roughly 2 million to start with and then for, you know, more than 2 million on the second year to kind of get you to the 4.6 million. So the, the four and a half is for two years. Yeah. It's a con, it, yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. I think to answer the other two 
questions that you had one was on NTE I believe that might have been in reference to a not to exceed okay um, just from an acronym and we should have caught that so I'm really sorry that that acronym slipped through and the other one was about input on staffing and I think I will um, I'd like to tee that off and if John if you want to come because I think it would be good to hear from from you as well we've been you know working with Jacob since they first proposed on the RFQ and the RFP for coming on board to help and assist with the operability considerations of phase one during pre-design and design work. And at that time, they had assembled a team of engineers, professionals, and operators. We got to meet one that we were hoping, you know, could have been the operator that would have been here um, at the project. Unfortunately, sometimes the stars do not always align with when this project comes online and when that um, that lead operator and, and plant manager would have been available for us. So we've talked about that a little bit about how will they be procuring. That is kind of this next period of where the contract approval would take place. And obviously, they're not really going to be commencing until Black and Beach has completed their work. The plan is passing all of the acceptance testing and um, startup commissioning. Everything is done there. They will then commence their contract and so between this time and when they take the plan over is when they will be going through that hiring. I do know that we will be a part of that and I would like to hopefully you can explain a little bit more on that. Sure. Thanks, Melanie. Um, John recommend Jacobs. Um, good evening. So, is, uh, is the button on? Is it on? I think it's okay. on. I just, get closer. just have to put your mouth on it. All right. Um, yeah, hiring is always one of the most exciting parts of starting one of these what we call greenfield projects. So there's no existing O&M staff for us to retrain to our best practices. So we're starting fresh, which was also a great opportunity. Um, so Paul and I actually have been extremely active on this. We had a number of interviews last week in anticipation of board approval. Um, and we've actually had some offers accepted for some senior level um, AW, uh, advanced water treatment certified operators in California. So we're making excellent progress on this, Melanie. It's been, it's been interesting, but we are excited that we have dates and contracts and commitments moving the right direction. So we're excited to do this. Um, as was mentioned by Cameron earlier though, in the event we are um, still not fully staffed with our onsite local team, we have 2,500 operators nationally and I have a team of quite a few of them that are road warriors and we show up and do what we need to do. Um, Paul's in the middle of a startup of a similar kind of a project right now in Washington State where we have a fleet of people descend on the site to make sure it starts up properly. So this is, this is what we do and we're looking forward to it here. Carla? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, I had that one question about the 4.6 million, million too, but um, actually I was curious about the six personnel and, and whether that would, you know, if they're working 40 hour weeks, how that would overlap uh, for weekends and nights. Um, as, uh, <clears throat> you know, new, new facilities and new machines, new anything often have bugs and things like that. It's, it feels like there's, uh, you know, that's, Something that we should anticipate and prepare for. I was just that was one of my concerns. Um, excited to have this project getting started. Uh, so I'd like, yeah, I'd like to hear a little bit more discussion on that because um, it seems like sort of a skeleton staff as proposed. I mean, just and uh, I would, and then I was also just curious about whether there'd be any interaction with the staff, the personnel at. Uh, the Santa Cruz wastewater treatment plant to, to train them and orient them on the thing, uh, on the project and, and the production. Uh, I wanted to hear about that. And uh, well, the last one is probably really hypothetical, but I wanted to know what would happen to this contract if we expanded production. Because um, there wasn't any mention of that on how that would work. Uh, whether the same personnel would be able to handle more production or whether, you know, what exactly would happen? What, is there anything in the agree, agreement to mention that? 
I know there's a termination, a no-fault termination, but is there corresponding expansion? Uh, and it, I guess that's it for the moment. There's probably always going to be questions, but those are the ones that, that hit me when I was reading it today. Right. Glenn, did you want to answer the contract one related to expansion? Yeah, the, con the contract has some fairly lengthy provisions about capital improvements, mm -hmm. um, and those most of that verbiage, it sets, it sets up a framework for the district and Jacobs to work together on those, but the di district is always the final arbiter of making decisions uh, because of the cost um, of having capital improvements. So probably the ultimate capital improvement you could have at the plant would be an expansion. So uh, I think we would anticipate um, during the, at least during the 10 year term, that if there was an expansion, that Jacobs would be um, continuing to be the own and provider um, for the, the expanded facility. I think that would require more staffing, uh, likely. Uh, and, uh, you know, we would have to work out the details of that in terms of cost. At the time of the expansion, there would have to be an amendment to the uh, contract to accommodate that. At, at this time, the contract is just for the size of the project. As we all know, this is a very defined project of 1,500 acre feet per year. Um, that is what the EIR is covered. If anything was to be expanded, we would have to go ahead and do an additional EIR, some additional design work. We would have to open up and discuss um, the operations considerations of, of the facility with Jacobs. Um, but as you also know, that the project was, was contemplated to be increased. So um, the, the footprint is large enough. Um, as Cameron mentioned, how we could expand it, but at this time, it's it's not included in in this operation. Even if, um, if there were a minor expansion, even that would fell in within the within the confines of the existing plant. How would that work? I would say that, um, and I'm foreseeing that. Of course, we'll be doing you know a good working relationship with with our contract operator that. If we were to operate and um, identify that there was an expansion, we first have to define um, what that would be, how long that would take. You know, the process to expand does take a while. Um, and then we would start to do that discussion and identify if they could do that with the existing staff or what kind of increase that would be. Yeah, and I would add any, any environmental review or actions that would need to be taken. I, I do think you also asked the question related to the collaboration and the working relationship with the City of Santa Cruz Public Works Department. Um, again, I, we have had an ongoing working relationship with the city during the design efforts as well as while we're in construction with the engineers that work down there as well as the operators, the electricians, uh, the, the SCADA and the communication technicians. Um, I foresee that will continue. Um, they are on our meetings currently. I believe they currently are. Um, as Glenn mentioned, we will continue meetings once the plant is operational, both monthly and weekly. So not only will, um, will collaboration be with um, the third party Omar, the city of Santa Cruz staff, and also our staff who will be um, doing the operations and maintenance for the pipelines and the seawater intrusion prevention wells. Did that. The question was whether the existing, the currently proposed staff is sufficient to uh, respond to emergencies off out. Yes, you do want to tee that up. I, I will say, before, as John comes comes up, we have always really listened to the board as well as the community related to staffing. That was something that the NWRI panel addressed. That they wanted us to make sure that. We were ready and prepared on all steps of the process, design, construction, and operation. Ron and I have probably called every single agency that has operated an IPR project in California and even beyond to get lessons learned, to get information, to get tips and tricks, and, to, and even today we were on calls. We're constantly trying to learn from other agencies and what they're doing whether it's contract operations or whether they are doing the operations in-house with city or county staff. 
We feel that the size that we have proposed with this contract has been with that input from other agencies, as well as Jacobs and their depth, and that it is sized. Um, we've also been working with the state. This facility, um, which has been identified in a lot of our planning documents, like the EIR, the engineering report, our operations and optimization plan that we're submitting to the state, is sized so that it can be um, accommodating um, a less than 10 million gallons per day facility, which this facility is, where 1.3 or 1,500 acre feet per year. Very, very similar to Santa Monica and several others that are about the 1 MGD size. And then, John, please feel free to add more. Thanks, Mel. Um, so, Director Christensen, to your other question, um, during that startup period where things are a little chaotic, we do have in our, um, our initial budget which is partly what Glenn described as is something we invest in up front. We bring in a, a large team of experts from all over the country uh, on a variety of things, technical, uh, instrumentation, HR, uh, safety training, all kinds of different experts for as long as it takes until we're stable. So that's part of the investment we make. That's reassuring. That's exactly when all the Perfect. thing might happen, most likely. But <laughs> Yeah, I'll also add, thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, Cameron will be working with them, you know, on a daily thing. We call him the master coordinator in a sense, so he could almost look like him as an extension or at least interwoven. The other thing is one of the, as Melanie touched on, the ideas of being budget conscious and uh, prudent, but uh, not at the sacrifice of water quality or anything like that. The thing that's one of the things that's appealing about a, a company like Jacobs is their deep bench, right? So they don't have to keep 10 people on that when they can keep six. And then when they need four more, they can call them in just periodically versus if we ran it, we might need all 10 all the time and that wouldn't be the most efficient. So that is, I would say, probably one of the greatest attributes besides they have vast experience in operating a facility such as this. Any other questions from other directors? So, Carl, I had the exact same question of whether, you know, the staffing was sufficient for that uh, initial period where bugs do or could possibly show up. Um, so, question for Glenn. So, if when we start up, there's, uh, it becomes obvious that we do need to have people on site for weekends or um, increase the, the staffing for a period of time. How is that accommodated? Is that, that an amendment to the contract? Well, right now it's contemplated that Jacobs has recommended the number of employees. So if they needed to have people working just for normal operations because of issues with the plant, that would really be at Jacobs risk. Um, we are paying them a fixed fee for operation of the plant. Now, if there's something extraordinary that happens, let, or let's say uh, a new contaminant has worked its way into um, the water discharge going to Santa Cruz and it makes its way to the plant um, in the, in the uh, treated water that comes um, to the AWPF, and this is not something that was previously contemplated as part of the treatment or the, or it impacts the treatment uh, to the quality standards that we're required to provide under the uh, permits, uh, then there is provision that we would um, engage um, Jacob's experts um, to deal with those un unknown or uh, unanticipated issues on a time and materials basis. Uh, but with respect to just getting the plant up and running and kind of dealing with those kinds of issues and over time, that is part of Jacob's fix fee. Okay. And then, if I may, since you've made the trip here, can you educate me on other plants that are similar to ours and what's happened with them? I recommend Jacobs. Um, so we were looking over our list recently, and there's some recent additions. Uh, it's probably 15 or 20 sites of various sizes doing uh, direct, indirect uh, potable reuse, um, Title 22 style reuse, 
um, commercial uh, membrane treatment systems. There's a lot of variations on the theme. Um, most of the sites we run are actually larger than yours mm -hmm. right now. Um, although we expect expansion at some point, um, the largest one is 66 MGD, so about 50 times bigger uh, than this facility, and that's in Australia. Um, and, and what types of issues show up with the smaller ones? I know it's a small sample size. Um, the issues tend to be the same uh, in my experience. It's instrumentation. That's a lot of the, the challenge. These systems are um, largely computer controlled. So the uh, redundancy you need on the control systems and the attention to the instrumentation that those control systems rely on that's that's really where the pinch point is for these facilities and that's going to be a lot of our focus during startup is making sure the instrumentation and control systems are correct okay thank you thank you any other questions uh i guess it's time for public comment then if there's anybody in the audience with initials i'm just joking <laughs> <laughs> becky <laughs> Well, um, for our guests here, do not be fooled into thinking that because how many people are here that nobody cares. Um, people are very worried about this. And so anything that you can do as an operator in conjunction with the district to make any and all data, positive and negative, publicly accessible you will be helping the public gain trust in this agency because we really don't have any now. I am happy to learn why the operation costs um, more than doubled from the, end, the initial estimate of two and a half million to five and a half million. This explains it. This is the first time we've had an explanation, even during the rate hearings was not explained. So um, I am worried that um, Jacobs will only be there five days a week during business hours, and the rest of the time will be running itself under instrumentation. I remember when the Marina um, One Water Project released nine million gallons of raw sewage into the bay because Nobody was there, and they were depending on the instrumentation, and it failed. And that was with redundancy. So we are very, and I speak for the public, we are very worried about these sorts of things happening and uh, going into polluting the groundwater. Um, you make the com comment that it's very pure water, but it actually isn't. The final anti-degradation analysis shows that it will be injecting nitrate, and chloride, and who knows what else, because it isn't. Um, a, it is an unregulated thing that's not reported to be. Uh, has to be reported. I'm I'm happy to learn what this at risk means you, because Becky. that was not explained. I'm the only one here. Can I have one more minute, please? You Director Hugh is shaking his head. No, <laughs> that's not. Becky, if we make exceptions, we're going to continue to make them. Let's stick to the two minutes and go with um, emails with your further questions. That no one answers, no one answers. Where can I see the contract? Thank you, would you please you. be respectful and sit down? I, I want to know where Stein I can Bruno. see the contract. There are references to section Stein of the contract. Please sit down, we'll they have are to ask not you to be escorted out. in the board packet. Ms. Steinbrunner, please it? sit down. Be respectful of everybody's time here. I Thank have you been very, very much, respectful Ms. Steinbrenner. with you, Thank Mr. You. Duncan, for many, many years. And please Thank sit you. down. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other board questions after hearing the public comment? If not, does anybody uh, want to make a motion or no motion? Second. Did I say that loud enough? I Sorry. second. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sorry, 
my mic was not on. Sorry. All oh. right. So this is a resolution. So does that mean roll call? Or is it? No. Josh, is this a resolution that requires a roll call vote? Uh, that's the board's pleasure. It could be a voice vote or we can do it by roll call. Let's do it by voice. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Seeing none, passes unanimously. That brings us to 7.3. Approve professional services agreement and scope of work for architectural and engineering services for the Pure Water SoCal Education and Operations Center renovation. Taj? Yes, good evening. Although um, Adam Bayer behind me has been the one really leading this effort and will be leading it through completion. So I'm going to introduce Adam Bayer to um, lead you through this item, if that's OK. Thank you, Adam. So you want me to tell you what the project is about? Whatever you think we need to know. Gotcha. OK. I so, mean, assuming that we read, yeah, yeah we have read it entirely. So just and like the, a thirty-second overview, uh, the main the motion, the main um, elements of this project are uh, what's called a change of use, which changes the building from its current um, use as a glass shop to uh, more of an office uh, arrangement, which is going to entail um, likely seismic upgrade. So it has to essentially bring it up to code the current code as if it was built today. So that's the primary focus of it. Um, the, um, the other two elements are the, um, the operation center component, which is essentially the secure storage area and the location for the six uh, operators or the six contingent of staff, uh, you know, to be able to be in the upstairs and in the um, secure storage area. Uh, the main element there is that it's got direct access off of Chanticleer, not through the um, the main gate, but um, directly off of Chanticleer, and then there's direct access through the back um, of, the, of the storage area. And then the other component is 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 the education center, which is the you know the, the what was formerly the showroom floor, um, and the main component there is how it's going to connect to the, the treatments plant itself. Um, one of the things, you know, Ron, that you had mentioned when I, when I was at the at the office uh, a few weeks ago was the, the notion that the 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 real um, thing to see there is the plant itself and not the education center. So the you know the focus is really to make that um, a, in large part I see it as um, very similar to what's to what's there now. Um, but really to make that connection to the plant so that the, um, the attraction is really to, to get into the plant and be able to see the process. So those are the main components. All right. Thank you. Um, any questions by directors? Well, I mean, I might just say that, you know, Jennifer and I were on the subcommittee to kind of look at the different mm -hmm. ones and, and it was really an interesting process, and Adam and Cameron was involved in that as well. And we were pretty happy with the with the approach that this group took. So, um, anyway, and the qualification. Okay, I would add um, that uh, there was a um, at least one late entry on the recommendation, and it was really positive. So uh, you know, it seems like. Like every turn we've had so far has has essentially resulted in positive feedback. References. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great references. All right. Are there any questions? Does somebody want to make a motion? Well, public comment. Uh, no public comment. Any any questions? I or a motion. Is, so uh, this is just a quick question. Um, the, are you going to change the footprint? Is that part of the proposal? Okay. It's one of the key okay. uh, aspects is it is its four walls stay the same. Okay. 
its its interior, uh, some of the you know the elements, the, the seismic elements, if it's not designed yet, but it's usually at the connection or in okay. uh, those types of things. Yes, good raw material there. I've been in there many times. So. I'll make the motion then to proceed. I'll second. Okay, we got that. Tom and Carla. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Sorry. Passes unanimously. So that ends the that ends the administrative business. And we now go into closed session. I believe there yeah, was a poll. Four point four. Four more? Four point, four point four. four was pulled. I oh yes, yes. Thank you. Hmm. All right. So I'll be glad to provide a quick overview or answer any questions, whatever the board's pleasure is regarding item 4.4, .4, renewal of a memorandum of agreement for the Santa Cruz County Integrated Regional Water Management Program. I right, interview. so Jennifer, you're... Yeah, thank you, Ron. Um, I had three quick questions. Um, the first one is um, the MOA commences January 1st of this year, but it's March 5th, just wondering about the delay. Yes, this goes out to numerous uh, entities that are part of it. So they're trying to get us all corralled. I don't know. I don't even believe we're the last to, the, to bring it to the, to the table. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I also was wondering about um, the plan of the 108 projects shows um, the status as of uh, 2022. And I'm wondering if there's anything that's more current or up to date or if that was the last time that they did that. Definitely things have evolved within that list, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, but just to back up to the big picture, what's hap what the big change that has happened with this group is that it used to be that we would kind of like fight as an entity or our own regional IRWM for funding. And now the state divvies portions up to each one, and then we work within our own um, region to how the money's divvied up. And you can see for Soquel Creek Water District, the return on investment's been substantial when you look at, we roughly yeah. contribute about 12 grand a year and we've gotten back over 3 million. Okay, yeah, it looks like an amazing group. They do good work. Um, and there's uh, all these environmental stewardship groups, including the County Parks Ecology Action, mm -hmm. Watsonville Wetlands Watch, Coastal Watershed Council, and the Villa Del Monte Mutual Water Company, which is like near Los Gatos. But um, I was wondering about the Amamutsin Tribal Band because they're not included, and just curious about that. I, th I know they're uh, involved uh, when they go out to do projects. I hear Tim Carson speak about them often and, and their role in different projects and contributions. So um, I know they're heavily involved. I, that's the extent that I Okay, can. they're just not listed anywhere. It may not be listed specifically, but okay. when a project is involved, that may have some impact to them. I see. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you very much for the clarification. Thank Seems you. like an amazing group. Me. Or shall I see you turned on your I made, a, I made a face, yeah. The, the members of the IRWM are agencies, yeah. and they're not tribal. They're oh, I understand. I read all of the plans and all of them. Yes, there's 13 yeah. agencies. They pay into it for their own yeah. projects. When, when they do yeah. their projects, they do look at the tribal and, you know, um, the CEQA and tribal issues, but we don't have, you know, County planning in there either. Who would be reviewing the CEQA? They're invited to the table when these projects go on. But yeah, like the Ecology the Action has like a lot of projects right. in there that are all environmental stewardship. And I know that the Tribal Band has environmental stewardship projects, but they're not listed. It was just I was wondering why, but I think he explained that. Thank you. Any other questions about four point four? Any public comment? Seeing none, Jennifer, do you want to make a motion on it? Yes, I would like to approve the MOA. Thank you. Okay, is there a second? Oh, second. Jennifer, Carla, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, 
Are we done? Done with that. <laughs> Just uh, uh, see if there's anybody who wants to comment before we go into public. I mean, to. Um, oh, yes. Is there, any, is there any public comment before we go into closed session? Seeing none. Okay. We're going to enter into closed session and then come out and. Yeah. Report. So we'll ask everybody to. Um, it's not involved with that.